For the average rider, is $350 in spring upgrade sufficient enough to make this bike work for you? Hey, how's it going? Welcome to my channel. All right, as I suggested in the intro, is $350 in spring upgrade sufficient for an average rider like myself on a really good day? Or am I gonna need to do cartridges and a whole new rear shock? Well, I really wanted to try just doing springs. Now, to give you context, I weigh about 210 pounds. So the bike was completely undersprung for me since it's sprung for someone 160, 170 pounds. So I really needed stiffer springs. So that's what I did. Now there were two spring rates for progressive springs that I could get for the front forks and i went with the lower one i talked to uh ted porter's beamer shop and got some advice from them they had two different uh spring rates they had a wilbur's that was uh, 0.6 kilograms per millimeter all the way up to the progression is up to 0.75 kilograms per millimeter and if i've got those numbers wrong i will correct it down below and then they had the Yakagar, which is essentially the same spring rate as the Hyper Pro, which is 0.6 kilograms per millimeter, all the way up to 0.9 kilograms per millimeter. So double the progression of the other springs. And when I talked to the guys at, at the Beamer shop, their recommendation based on the type of riding I do and my weight that I go with the one that went from 0.6 to 0.75. And the reason for that, as they said, unless I'm out riding really, really hard, I would not be able to use full travel on that fork spring. Now, ordinarily, I would err on, a heav on the heavier spring side, but I decided to go ahead and listen to them and try this spring and see how it does. And so far, I've been pleased. Now, on the shock, I went to Rally Raid and got a single rate spring for the rear shock. Now I think the standard rate is 0 0.7, I don't know, I'll put it down here, Some, somewhere like 70 or seven kilograms per millimeter, I'll, I'll put it down. And I decided not to go to their stiffest, which was 95 kilograms, but actually go to 90 kilograms and be just one step below. So it would still be compliant and hopefully try to match the front and rear. Now, I personally did not want to use a progressive rear spring because the linkage on this bike already has built-in progressive spring rates. So whatever your standard spring rate, the way the linkage works is it's, um, it's a rising rate linkage. So your spring rate is going gonna, gonna to adjust and become stiffer the closer you get to bottoming out. So I didn't want to put a progressive spring and then change that, that rate to be much steeper. I wanted to keep the same rate just with a stiffer spring. So hopefully that makes sense. I'll put a chart on here if I'm able to figure out how to do that and, and explain to you the steepness of a progressive spring over a standard rate spring. Now I'm out in Big Bend National Park trying out the suspension out here. I'm still kind of dialing the uh, compression damping and the rebound damping on the front and the rear trying to get it balanced and to feel just about right. Now I can definitely tell after spending a few days riding out in Arizona on the BDR and some other back, back roads there that the suspension sits a much higher in its travel. Now it is, I'm able to dial in sag and not just blow through where uh, the previous springs, I had the, the preload completely cranked up and I was still sagged way too much. And the same for the front. I don't have any preload I can put on there, but I can tell it's already sitting higher in its travel, closer to what it should be around that 30% mark. Now out here, there's been uh, a lot of bumps, square edges, G outs, and uh, just a lot of varying terrain. There's been loose terrain, uh, steep, steep down, steep ups. And so far the suspension has done what I wanted it to do. It feels, the bike overall feels more playful than it did before. Before it had a soggy feel to it. Now it's not quite as soggy and it feels like it is a little bit more responsive and I can do more things with it to get it to go where I want it to. Now, 
I, I'm just an average rider on the best of days. I'm only riding maybe at my 50% capacity. I'm not racing at all out here. I'm riding by myself. My goal is to get from point A to point B, um, not dump the bike, not put myself in any risk. One more quick comment, observation with uh, new springs on here. Yesterday I was leaving uh, Big Bend National Park on Old Mavic Road and it is heavily corrugated, lots of washboards. And with the previous spring setup suspension um, at 25, 30 miles per hour, it was jarring. And that was when I was in Arizona. It, I, I just could not go all that fast. The suspension felt like it packed up and it was, it was quite rough. But yesterday, 25, 30 miles per hour, it's very smooth. It was smooth enough that I felt comfortable doing about 45 on the corrugate corrugations. I could have gone faster uh, and it would have been completely smooth, but that was kind of a speed I felt was, was comfortable. And uh, I really, really noticed the difference with these springs since the bike sits higher in its travel um, blasting over. Uh, it was a huge difference from what I had experienced when I was in Arizona. So with that being said, I think for now, the $350 I spent on the fork springs and the shock were well worth it. And I can definitely tell a difference, especially considering that when I bought this bike, I had numerous people telling me that the first thing I needed to do was replace the fork cartridges and put a new shock on. I'm not that good of a rider where, yeah, I could get more out of the bike if I did that, but I don't think... Uh, the juice is worth the squeeze in this case. So if you have one of these bikes and your weight is higher than what the standard spring rate is meant to be, then maybe consider just adding, changing springs out and that will get you the bike feeling the way you want it to without spending a fortune. Now I will go through the installation of the fork springs and how to pull the shock out and, and uh, replace it. The great thing about the shock you don't have to pull the back wheel, just lift it up. And then there's a, there's a panel in the back slips out, go take it into the shop. They'll change the spring out for you. And you can put it right back in. If you're going to change out your fork springs, you really should do the shock spring as well. And what I haven't been seeing too much from people upgrading their suspensions is just how easy it is to remove the shock. So I'm going to go through that real quick. I'm not going to try to change the shock spring myself. I'm going to take it into the service center. But if you pull the shock, which is two panels and two bolts, you can take this in. I don't know what the cost will be. I will uh, go over that once I get the shock back. But that way you have a better sprung rear shock and you're not just doing everything on the springs. Overall, this will give you a much better feel on your bike and keeping it in the budget oriented suspension upgrade. Boy, it's really hard not to just do this as well since it's so easy to pull the shock and have someone else uh, swap them out for you. They have the tools, should only take them, really take a technician 15 minutes to do this with the right tools. On both sides of the bike, there is this um, panel here. And to get to the shock bolt, the upper shock bolt, you just pull this panel off of each side. And I'll do that real quick and then I'll show you how to get to the bolt. It's really, really easy. All right, all you need is a T30 Torx to get these three out. And I'll just pop that. These are really, really easy to pull out. And the panel just pops off. I think there might be one or two tabs that you have to line up, but it's really easy. All right, I have the panel off on this side. And that bolt right there in the middle is the uh, shock top shock bolt. It has flanges on both sides of it to hold it in place. So you don't have to put a wrench on this side of it, just the other side. And I believe it's a 17, but we'll confirm that when we take it off. This mud flap here, there's two torques, one on either side. Take each of those off and you can pull the shock out right over the top of the rear tire. And it makes it really easy to get out. So I'm gonna take this mud flap off now. All right, there's the uh, nut for the bolt that goes through the top of the shock. And that is a 17, so I'm going to put a wrench on that and pull that off. And I might have to reach on the back side and just push the bolt through so it doesn't come out of the flanged side just to make it easier to hold it in place. So I'm going to get that nut pulled off first before I do the bottom. This is the bottom bolt of the shock. It's a 17 on this side and the nut is a 14 on the other side. So I'm going to get that pulled out. I'm going to get it loosened. 
and I'm gonna pull the top bolt and then the bottom bolt and then I'll show you just how to pull it off the back of the wheel. Hopefully this will be visible how I'm gonna do this. So I'm gonna pull the bolt out of the bottom pin and just kind of let the shock rest there. And then I'm going to reach in here and slide it out right over the tire. All right, shock is out and it is ready for the new spring. If I wasn't filming, I probably could have done this in about 10 minutes, uh, but with filming, it took a little bit longer. This is a really easy thing to do. So if you are upgrading your suspension, changing the fork springs yourself is a lot harder than pulling the shock out and taking this in and getting the new one put on. Now, I don't recommend really um, doing this yourself unless you have a proper spring compressor. New spring is installed on the shock. Here's the old spring. It costs $53 for the springs to be switched out. Now, if you're thinking you should just try to do it yourself, the Motion Pro tool, which is like a little benchtop tool, costs $180 for the tool itself in order to be able to compress springs. To change them, there's some other little devices that you can use that I've used on springs. These are really, really stiff springs. I don't recommend that either. I think it's just more trouble than it's worth. So spend the $50. $53 or whatever your shop charges to get the rear spring changed. It's totally worth it to make sure that uh, this is all um, properly sprung. So I'm gonna get this installed, not basically just reverse process of what I did, taking it out. The one tip, the one thing I do recommend is the bolts that go through, grease them because this is gonna have a little bit of movement and pivot on those. So grease those bolts before you put them back in. It's time to change the fork springs. I've already taken one out. I just wanted to see what the process was gonna be. And it was actually a lot simpler than I was expecting. I think that's because the spring rate on the new springs is not really super extreme. Now, if this is something you're wanting to do, I really think this is easy. As far as doing mechanic work on your bike, this should be something that if you're wanting to work on your bike that you feel comfortable doing. So I'll just go through a couple of the steps and what I do um, in, in order to change out the springs. And I'm not gonna go through every single detail, but enough that you could look at it and make a decision on your own on whether or not you think you can do that. So let's, let's get to getting this last spring put in. All right, I'm just gonna make a couple of notes. I won't show the whole process because it'll just be faster for me to get ripped through it. So I think for what I'm doing is I've left this center guard right in the middle. Um, connected to the brakes. And the reason I did that is I'm just taking one leg out at a time so I don't have to pull all this out. So I already did this outside. I took off the cover. I dropped the caliper off of it and the ABS sensor. And then I was able to slide it off and leave this in place. So this side, I'm going to just basically take the brake caliper off. It'll stay suspended from the plastic here. And then I can drop the fork out. Now, a couple uh, two quick notes is I've put some tape here to mark how far the fork is inserted into the triple clamp to make sure I get it lined up and that they end up being at the same height. It's just making sure that I know what the distance is and, and that's just a one way to do it. The other thing is when you go to take off the cap, an easy way to take the cap off is just loosen the top of the triple clamp Keep the bottom tight and then take the 19 millimeter wrench that you need and get break loose the cap while it's already in this really easy, nice clamp. So that'll save you some, some trouble trying to get that loosened up when you take it off. So that, that's what I do. So I'm going to go ahead and get the fork leg pulled out on this side and then we'll take the next steps of getting it pulled apart. I have the fork leg in a bicycle stand. I find that the bicycle stand, the clamp on it, works really perfectly for holding this. I can clamp it in there, uh, grab it, and have a place to work on things and be able to move it up and down in order to get the springs in and out. Um, I've just been very fortunate with that and that mountain biking has had some uh, added benefits. So I'm just going to pull the cap off and once that's loose, not quite, yep, there we go. 
and we can push this up. And then what I'm gonna do is put something underneath the fork leg to push it all the way up. All right, so what I need to do now is take this cap off right here, and that is um, a 17 inside of here. Now the standard spring, it's pretty easy to get the 17 in here, but with the uh, progressive, it's gonna be a little bit different and we'll need to use a, a thin wrench. So I'm gonna put this, slide this in here, and that's what makes this fork quite easy to work on. And then we'll pop this loose and get the cap taken off. Okay, so I'm gonna set that someplace where it won't fall on the floor and get dirty. And there's also this spacer that goes over the top of the spring. So we'll keep that. And when you pull a spring out, you're gonna get oil everywhere. I like to wrap the fork body. So when this comes out, just take it slowly. And there, that spring is out. Now I've got to set the fork oil depth, uh, the air gap. So I'll go over that real quick. I don't have the fancy tool that Motion Pro makes to set over the top where you set the air gap and then use a syringe to pull it up. I do it the old fashioned way, which is kind of using a straw finger and creating a little vacuum in it. So I've marked um, essentially 120 millimeter air gap so i'll slide this down in the fork and then just pinch it off and pull the oil out and uh, remove it until i get to that 120 millimeter um, it's kind of a crude way of doing it but this doesn't have to be exact i just need to get it as close to 120 as possible and this is what i'm choosing to do so i'm going to go ahead and do that all right real quick note before we put the spring in the oil levels between the two different forks were different not by a lot but it was you know, maybe, maybe 10 millimeter uh, air gap difference. It's not rocket science. Uh, a little bit of difference isn't gonna be a big deal. Now, if you have 10,000 more, 10,000 or more miles on your fork when you do this, probably should change the oil. I only have about 3,000 miles on these forks. So I'm gonna stay with the same oil, it is extremely clean. I have done, I haven't done that much off-roading to where you start getting stuff underneath the uh, oil seals. So, um, leaving it. So just, just as a quick note. So let's get the spring installed. All right, this is a bit of a tricky part, trying to get the uh, damper rod up um, through the spring. There's a couple ways. I've seen people wrap strings and pull it up, but I just kind of worked it up with my pliers and some fingers to hold it in place. And because this isn't a overly stiff spring, it is pretty easy to hold it and then get the, the cap twisted back on. Now, the, you can see the coils on, I don't know if you can see this or not, but the coils on this side are more compressed. They're closer together. So I'm gonna put that on the upward direction so it doesn't displace as much oil as it would if I put that down. So um, we'll get started doing that. Okay, and to hold that, put this down, and hopefully this will fit. Okay, that's pretty easy. The, another way mountain biking has came in handy is I have these thin uh, wrenches. So this fits really well in the spring here. So I'm going to put this on here and hold it while I screw the cap down. Uh, quick note, make sure your locking nut doesn't sneak up um, on the, the stem here, the, where the cap comes down. So make sure you get your cap all the way down. And then once you get the cap down, then you can get this locking nut put in place and get it tightened up. So that's what I'm going to do now.
Okay, now we just need to um, screw the cap back in. I will snug it up once it's in the triple clamp and I've got the bottom uh, cinch bolts tightened up. Before I put the fork back in, I have these Tusk fork socks um, I've had for a while. I just haven't had a chance to use them. I'm gonna put these on and put them down over the seal to try to help keep debris and stuff from getting up in the seal and protecting it. I have seen people have had pretty good success with, with different versions of these neoprene socks. So I'm gonna do that. Okay, sock is on. I'm gonna put a, a zip tie around the top just to hold it in place so it doesn't slide down. And this moves pretty easily, so I don't expect it to add any stiction to the fork. All right, if you own a T7, hopefully this gave you some ideas of how to improve the suspension without spending a fortune. And I know that trying to get the, the 0.6 to 0.9, the really stiff progressive spring can be really, really challenging, but the 0.6 to 0.7, wasn't that bad at all. So um, yeah, just do what you need to do to get the bike to fit you. If you don't wanna spend a fortune, hopefully this will be something that you can consider to get it to perform better. Now, if you have done the cartridges and the shock, let me know in the comments below what your experience has been. Was it worth spending two, three, four thousand $4,000, whatever you spent? And if you did do that, let us know down in the comments how much you spent on upgrading the suspension and more importantly would you do it again i think that's the bigger question that we need to ask is um after you spent the money yes obviously there's going to be a performance improvement but was it worth it so anyway hopefully you got value out of this video if you have any questions about any of the things that i've done suspension related to this bike leave that in the comments below as well if you haven't done it yet do that thing down below, really appreciate it. Anyway, um, from out here in Big Bend, get out, do some riding, ride safe, and I will see you out there.